How are you, Peter? What's this class? This class is Environmental Systems One, and we have been studying affordable, sustainable housing, and we are going to soon see some examples of the students' Pecha Kucha work, making all of the class come together in one fell swoop. Nice. Okay. Hi, um, we are a team, and my team consists of me, Jackie Gallardo, uh, Shane, Tommy, Mohammed, Jessica, and this is our presentation. So Housing First is about affordable housing in cities and what we can do to break the barriers and make things easier to create affordable housing within urban cities and create smaller urban villages. Um, basically, some of our ideas included removing freeways, changing the zoning um, of existing buildings, Higher city, higher city architects, um, city planning groups, and fill empty space with brand new flats. Um, some of these things that are especially restrictive are zoning codes, uh, zoning code changes. Uh, so the most difficult thing and most restrictive um, are zoning laws, which um, we can't. We're not allowed to go in certain areas. We're not allowed to do certain things, if these were to be able to, um, to be more flexible, then we would be able to um, create more affordable housing. Um, regional materials, we could also use regional materials to create affordable housing. Instead of just using um, regular building materials, we could incorporate other things that are considered waste that would reduce the cost of construction. Um, such things as like byproducts and the spent grains that are used in food production can be used as um, like compacted building materials. Uh, carbon priming is not technically a building material, however it can help in sustainability and sequester carbon from the environment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> um, okay, so hepcrete is another one of these building materials. Um, it is uh, the inner woody core of the hemp plant, um, and it has a high silica content, which is interesting, and it makes it um, mix very well with lime-based materials. So when mixing uh, hempcrete with or, uh, uh, the inner woody core of the hemp uh, plant with the um, the lime-based binder, you can build construction walls. Um, straw barrel construction is another one of these materials. Um, these are super insulating walls made out of stacked straw bales. Um, another uh, interesting aspect to these are they're very fire resistant. Um, this is a picture of a, like your typical wooden structure, and then this over here is the same fire that it went through, but um, it was used in utilizing the straw bale construction. Um, it's also very inexpensive. Uh, sea salt building blocks is the next material. Um, this is a mixture of sea salt and starch. Um, it is very good in compression, a little bit better than rammed earth in compression, uh, which makes it good for arches and vault type structures. Um, it's white in color, so it reflects the sun very well, so utilizing it with some type of solar material would be very um, efficient. Um, and this technique would also raise the demand for desalinization plants. Um, solving the issue of what to do with the salt after um, the process is finished. Um, recycled plastic brick, I don't know what happened here, but um, this is, uh, these are small bricks and uh, building materials, so these beams here um, and these blocks here are made out of recycled um, plastic bags. Um, they are 20 square meter, or they built a 20, or 40 square meter two bedroom home um, in five days, it only cost them $6,800 per unit, so they're very cheap. Um, it's also 6.6 .6 pounds, uh, which is about the same amount as a, a normal brick. Um, and if you were to integrate some type of um, different building uh, structure, like steel or timber, um, the height limit would be pretty much endless. Um, or well, the same as the, the, um, whichever system you would use, so steel or timber. 
Um, and then utilizing uh, like a plastic bag from San Diego landfills would be a good way to start that process. All right, thank you so much, Tony. Hi, everyone. I am Shane. And we're now going to shift gears to looking at the issue of what is going to happen with sea level rise. And our case study here is Mission Bay and Mission Beach. Mission Beach is a very thin strip of land that is just west of Mission Bay. And that is a very important both residential and commercial district that connects Pacific Beach as well as uh, SeaWorld. So, this is um, an example from Coronado of how we can actually adapt to sea level change. So it's divided into three categories, which is protect, protection, accommodation, and retreat. And we can see some quick examples of what that would look like. Retreat would essentially be moving these businesses away from the shore. So in the case of Mission Beach, that would basically be no more businesses on Mission Beach. Floodproof structures, on the other hand, would elevate everything so that with that sea level rise uh, through columns and piers, we could actually still have that infrastructure. And for armament and building a levee, that's actually literally building a defense wall so that we could actually mitigate the sea level rise from these businesses. And now another thing to do with that area is one of the most important air er businesses in that area, and one of the only businesses really, is SeaWorld. And so one thing that we could do that would actually help some of the ethical um, issues that some people have with SeaWorld as well as take advantage of the situation is actually move the concept of the theme park into an actual water park area, which would include actually raising the seabed just off the shore, which would create a sort of underwater barrier, allowing for the shallow infill that could be then used to show the public an actual real sea world while also reducing that sea level rise from Mission Beach and protecting it. And from there, we we'll move. Okay, my name is Wakamna. So this is one of the shirts that we have done in our class. So it's about the neighborhood and then we, uh, we try to help them to uh, help them to design the cul de sac in the area. So and then here is some strategies that we came up is about the green room and solar panel. So there is a canyon here, and then we designed the right fall to protect from the the fire that is the area and how to capture the water rain. And we provide some uh, pavement to capture the water in the area. And here, this is another that we had about healthy urbanism concept in downtown San Diego. So, and we designed the neighborhood, we considered the vertical farming, solar panel for all of the roof, bicycle pathways. Here is another concept about the providing the green spaces and rezoning to allow misuse. Uh, so next we uh, had the tiny house. So a couple of examples. We have two site plan uh, charrettes that we did, but both basically considered the um, uh, protecting the site uh, and making sure it's fire resistant, uh, having um, uh, fire resistant landscaping like rock gardens, but also uh, garden areas to do community, uh, community planting. Uh, water catchment systems and um, uh, recycling water. And uh, some one of the designs that we thought about uh, was uh, creating thermal mass walls uh, and water collection systems for the bathroom and kitchen and wind catching systems uh, to uh, for energy power and then these panels that move. Uh, that can provide a bed or a couch to make flexible spaces. And uh, an example layout of that is um, like if we had 10 feet by 10 feet um, rooms where the uh, same dimension was a wall placed at uh, the middle, it can be moving panels 
uh, to create flexible spaces where it can open up for light, open up uh, to the garden, um, and be uh, can change a living room to a bedroom, and so on. So it provides the flexibility uh, for the user and also for connection with the neighbors and also uh, provides privacy. Okay, so this is uh, about the research that we had about the issue of the traffic in San Diego. Uh, there are so many elements that they cause traffic, but the main one, according to the research that I had, is about the zoning that uh, separate the land use so and then eliminate the walkability of the street. So, for example, if you want to get a loop of bread, you have to drive for 10 minutes, 20 minutes to get. And then, so, and then the solution would be to rezone to allow the mixed use in the area for the retail and so, and then this is the project our studio class. So it's a school project, and then the sustainable features are solar panel in the roof, and roof garden, there are some a screen for protector on the best side, and then there are the cross ventilation according to the rectangular form. So, I performed deeper research into recycled water, and some really quick takeaways from that are the use of recycled water in San Diego. Um, for recycled gray water, there's actually a lot of applications that we could replace potable water, such as toilet flushing and irrigation, which actually comprise a pretty decent amount of the water demand in San Diego. An even more intense and amazing project that San Diego actually is moving forward with is called Pure Water, which is going to open its first phase in 20, er, 2023 which will actually take recycled water and purify it to make potable water, about 35 or 30 million gallons a day by 2023, and by 2035, an entire 85 million gallons a day. So, this is my studio project, which is a school for brewing and fermentation, and that would be taking um, some of the recycled water techniques for irrigating the gardens, um, as well as throughout the infrastructure, such as toilet flushing. Um, other sustainable uses within the building are going to include the brewery waste recycling that was discussed earlier, such as using spent grains for feeding livestock, making granola bars, maybe using that for different building materials. Um, and then there would also be solar panels on the roof to help with renewable energy. All right, so uh, my further research was in water pollution at the Tijuana uh, San Diego border. Um, so the cross-border water pollution continues uh, along the coastline, and here's an image of, of uh, what the effects are. Um, and what, what really was the issue is the Tijuana River sit, Valley sits between the U.S. and Mexico both. So it, it starts to become this politically charged um, matter resting on communication and funding. Um, so whose fault is it? It's kind of a mixed bag. Um, and right now we're utilizing a top-down approach at the national level, and it doesn't really seem to work. So um, because of this, Tijuana River Valley becomes this kind of gray area of governmental issues. Um, implementing a bottom-up approach would actually help resolve the issues. So utilizing local architecture um, that, that has like individual sewage treatment systems um, before it actually gets dispersed um, and maybe the answer to this. Um, and my studio project um, that I've been working on is called DAP Academy. It's a school um, that utilizes learning through observation and community engagement. Um, and I took uh, two different gathering spaces that are very iconic in our history, which is the um, tree canopy and the fireplace, and integrated them in the classroom to heighten that idea of observation. Um, some of the environmental conditions that it's responding to are um, air and light. Um, so I uh, implemented a louver system to um, help shade the, the in, inner classrooms and extended overhangs for shading as well. 
Um, and then I also raised the classroom uh, building, which is this building right here, um, about a foot off the plinth so that air can flow underneath. Uh, for my research, uh, I focused, I've been focusing on emotional intelligence in architecture and uh, started with identifying uh, seven elements to help raise the EQ in architecture. And um, some of those things are light and shadow, texture, materiality, contrast, smell, patterns, matrix, scale. So all of these um, uh, require sustainable design. And uh, so some of the ways that uh, these are helpful is that in, in helping to make San Diego's built environment uh, healthier and more sustainable is uh, the use of stairs um, and uh, um, uh, redesigning how we use alleys to make them more community centers and other walking areas uh, tiny home developments uh, and walking paths that can be used within these uh, alleys and other uh, and connecting communities along with bicycle paths. Um, and then uh, planting and landscaping with the, the local uh, plants. And again, for this area, uh, things that are more fire resistant and uh, resistant to drought. So essentially these uh, elements can help uh, when we are putting that into this perspective, uh, it makes it clear um, the importance of the sustainable designs. So my studio thesis, um, again, is uh, developing an emotionally intelligent architectural language. So some of the questions that are being asked are, what are we communicating with architecture? Uh, what is our built environment communicating to us? Does it hear our needs, concerns, desires, and fears? Uh, or is it apathetic, indifferent of our presence and well-being? And is the architecture saying, I care or don't care about you? Uh, and so part of this process, uh, the design process, is to present solutions for a healthier built environment. And this includes um, abstracting research and observations and site vi visits. Identifying uh, through documenting, experience, uh, experimenting, uh, organizing, categorizing, and then uh, giving examples with precedents and also uh, new designs. Right. So, my paper focused on hydroponics and aquaponics and reducing the impact of farming on our potable water. Um, as you know, California is one of the most uh, one is the, one of the largest producers of produce, and we supply 50% of the nation with their produce. Um, hydroponics and aquaponics reduces the amount of water by anywhere from one sixth to a tenth of what traditional agriculture uses. Traditional agriculture uses 70% of our potable water, and um, basically, with hydroponics and aquaponics, it'll reduce the amount of food miles between the producer and consumer if we utilize aquaponics and hydroponics within urban communities. And it also increases food security within cities that they'll be able to produce their own foods and feed their communities. Um, my studio project was for urban agriculture and it promotes healthy living and promotes community involvement and sustainability. It also informs and educates communities about food production and by creating a uh, sustainable system uh, within these urban environments, we'll be able to sustain more people within that setting. And that is the end of our project. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Hi, um, we are a team. And my team consists of me, Jackie Gallardo, uh, Shane, Hami, Mohammed, Jessica, and this is our presentation. So Housing First is about affordable housing in cities and what we can do to break the barriers and make things easier to create affordable housing within urban cities and create smaller urban villages. Um, basically, some of our ideas included removing freeways, changing the zoning um, of existing buildings, higher city, higher city architects, um, city planning groups, and fill empty space with brand new flags. 
Um, some of these things that are especially restrictive are zoning codes, uh, zoning code changes. Uh, so the most difficult thing and most restrictive um, are zoning laws, which um, we can't, we're not allowed to go in certain areas, we're not allowed to do certain things. If these were to be able to, um, to be more flexible, then we would be able to um, create more affordable housing. Um, regional materials, we could also use regional materials to create affordable housing. Instead of just using um, regular building materials, we could incorporate other things that are considered waste that would reduce the cost of construction. Um, such things as like byproducts and the spent grains that are used in food production can be used as um, like compacted building materials. Uh, carbon farming is not technically a building material, however, it can help in sustainability and sequester carbon from the environment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> um, okay, so hepcrete is another one of these building materials. Um, it is uh, the inner woody core of the hemp plant, um, and it has a high silica content, which is interesting, and it makes it um, mix very well with lime-based materials. So when mixing uh, hempcrete with or, uh, uh, the inner woody core of the hemp uh, plant with the um, the lime-based binder, you can build construction walls out of it. Um, straw barrack construction is another one of these materials. Um, these are super insulating walls made out of stacked straw bales. Um, another uh, interesting aspect to these are they're very fire resistant. Um, this is a picture of uh, like your typical wooden structure, and then this over here is the same fire that it went through, but um, it was used utilizing the straw bale construction. Um, it's also very inexpensive. Uh, sea salt building blocks is the next material. Um, this is a mixture of sea salt and starch. Um, it is very good in compression, a little bit better than rammed earth in compression, uh, which makes it good for arches and vault type structures. Um, it's white in color, so it reflects the sun very well, so utilizing it with some type of solar material would be very um, efficient. Um, and this technique would also raise the demand for desalinization plants, um, solving the issue of what to do with the salt after um, the process is finished. Um, recycled plastic brick, I don't know what happened here, but um, this is, uh, these are small bricks and uh, building materials, so these beams here um, and these blocks here are made out of recycled um, plastic bags. Um, they are 20 square meter, or they built a 20, or 40 square meter two bedroom home um, in five days and only cost them $6,800 per unit, so they're very cheap. Um, it's also 6.6 .6 pounds, uh, which is about the same amount as a, a normal brick. Um, and if you were to integrate some type of um, different building uh, structure, like steel or timber, um, the height limit would be pretty much endless. Um, or well, the same as the, the um, whichever system you would use, so steel or timber. Um, and then utilizing uh, like a plastic bag from San Diego landfills would be a good way to start that. All right, thank you so much, Tony. Hi, everyone. I am Shane. And we're now going to shift gears to looking at the issue of what is going to happen with sea level rise. And our case study here is Mission Bay and Mission Beach. Mission Beach is a very thin strip of land that is just west of Mission Bay. And that is a very important both residential and commercial district that connects Pacific Beach as well as uh, SeaWorld. So, this is um, an example from Coronado of how we can actually adapt to sea level change. So it's divided into three categories, which is protect, protection, accommodation, and retreat. And we can see some quick examples of what that would look like. Retreat would essentially be moving these businesses away from the shore. So in the case of Mission Beach, that would basically be no more businesses on Mission Beach. 
Flood proof structures, on the other hand, would elevate everything so that with that sea level rise uh, through columns and piers, we could actually still have that infrastructure. And for armament and building a levee, that's actually literally building a defense wall so that we could actually mitigate the sea level rise from these businesses. And now another thing to do with that area is one of the most important air businesses in that area, and one of the only businesses really, is SeaWorld. And so one thing that we could do that would actually help some of the ethical um, issues that some people have with SeaWorld as well as take advantage of the situation is actually move the concept of the theme park into an actual water park area, which would include actually raising the seabed just off the shore, which would create a sort of underwater barrier, allowing for the shallow infill that could be then used to show the public an actual real sea world while also reducing that sea level rise from Mission Beach and protecting it. And from there, we we'll move. Okay, my name is Mohammed. So this is one of the charades that we have done in our class. So it's about the neighborhood. And then we, uh, we try to help them to uh, help them to design the cul de sac in the area. So and then here is some strategies that we came up is about the green room and solar panels. So there's a canyon here and then we designed the right fall to protect from the the fire that is the area and how to capture the water rain and we provide some uh, pavement to capture the water in the area and here this is another share that we had about healthy urbanism concept in downtown San Diego so and we designed the neighborhood we consider the vertical farming solar panel for all of the roof bicycle pathways. Here is another concept about the providing the green spaces and rezoning to allow misuse. Uh, so next we uh, had the tiny house. So a couple of examples. We have two site plan uh, charrettes that we did, but both basically considered the um, uh, protecting the site uh, and making sure it's fire resistant, uh, having um, uh, fire resistant landscaping like rock gardens, but also uh, garden areas to do community, uh, community planting. Uh, water catchment systems and um, uh, recycling water. And uh, you're good. Hi, everyone. Um, we're we are a team too. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, Dakota, Cody, Eric, Eunice, myself. So to get things started, um, I know the last group uh, touched on this sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise is expected to rise by at least a meter, which is almost 3.3 feet um, in this century. So uh, it's a lot. And what's causing it? Well, climate change. And as a result of climate change, we get global warming. And because of global warming, we get melting of ice caps and glaciers, as well as an increase in ocean heat. So why do we care? Uh, well, it, it threatens to destroy our beaches. It pushes back the coastline, destroys ecosystems, and increases storm surges. So we have a lot of solutions. Um, housing, for example, can we can stop investors from putting developments near the shore. Uh, infrastructure, and then there's also a lot of wild ideas that we've talked about, such as like floating architecture and things like that. So uh, if I had time, I would open this, but I don't. So this image here is um, basically what San Diego would look like under 3.3 feet. Actually, sorry, I think this is actually six weeks. I want it to be a little more dramatic. But um, as you can see, the uh, airport would be gone. Coronado, the naval base becomes its own island. This is the convention center here. Uh, so this picture here is basically the convention center underwater. So right now they're currently pumping out water from the parking structure every day. So this also affects our biodiversity. And as we've discussed, uh, San Diego is the most biologically rich county in the US. So um, it's also the most threatened. 
sea level is threatening this. It's causing a loss of wetlands, um, which helps protect um, from sea level rise. So um, species also, like no matter how small they are, play a really important role. Um, they help actually mitigate all of these bad things that happen. Um, wildfires, droughts, they help restore it. So, um, so protecting against the preparation and finding solutions to major damage of coastal communities is imperative. It's also the most cost efficient way rather than waiting for something to happen. Um, so the top picture here is actually of New York, but I really love this solution. It's York Ingalls and Big. Their solution for um, downtown Manhattan creating this big park basically, which I thought would be a really great solution to do here as well. Um, and the bottom was, I really love that, it's like a float, it's floating architecture. Uh, so those are some of the crazier ideas, and I think some of the um, materials that Tommy mentioned could also be used for uh, this infrastructure. So another main thing affecting the oceans is beach pollution. Um, the three biggest ones are cigarettes, plastics, and styrofoams. Uh, none of them are biodegradable. They're super harmful to not only the ocean, but to wildlife and to us. Um, another thing is also runoff. Um, basically, we have all these pollutions coming into the ocean that aren't being treated from our, from humans. Uh, and then this is really quick, my studio project and how I'm using some methods of sustainability. Another thing not pictured is uh, the west facade pretty much has no windows, so. Hello, I'm Dakota, and for my studio project, I was looking at forms of uh, passive ventilation to kind of reduce our uh, reliance on refrigerants, uh, applying some uh, techniques from a book, Sunwood and Light, by G.Z. Brown and Mark K. Uh, it uses vertical, uh, transverse, and longitudinal ventilations. Uh, systems uh, that we use now are kind of heavily reliant on HVAC. And some research that I looked into uh, to also kind of help with energy is um, microgrids. Uh, uh, UCSD here, local in San Diego, is also kind of leading the front on this charge. Uh, they have a multitude of different methods. They have a 2.8 megawatt fuel cell that runs on biogas, 2.3 megawatts of solar panels, uh, and 30 watt, uh, megawatt natural gas fire uh, combined heat and power system. Uh, Certain things in San Diego that we can use for sustainability is we, uh, if we go down to zero waste, we're um, kind of pillaging what is actually in our landfills. Um, and another issue that we were looking at was um, pedestrian permeability. Uh, we looked at Mission Valley as a case study of this. It has a major freeway that runs through it. Um, and it kind of becomes this urban wasteland where if you kind of want to walk somewhere, and you can see it, you can't reach it because uh, there's no way to access it through the eight. So planning for infrastructure, uh, maybe elevated bike paths. This is a photo of, uh, produced by BMW of an elevated bike path that might be a solution to that. These are looking at certain ways that we might address the site and see what is important to us and these can be layered on top of each other. Uh, this was done as a design charrette and kind of see what is important to this site and what we should be designing for. So I'll start with my studio project. It's um, LINK. It's a high school for integrative learning. Um, the curriculum is designed to build connections between topics, such as um, building, gardening, nutrition, and physical education, and then reach out into the community as additional resources. It's response to some of the content within the um, environmental um, science course is using uh, cross-laminated timber, which has two advantages. The trees absorb and sequester carbon, and the process of producing these materials generate uh, fewer greenhouse emissions than other materials. Um, although the building itself um, may be made of sustainable material, other facets like transportation and having students get to the school um, have an impact on the school's role within the community itself. My midterm paper discussed um, transportation within Greater San Diego um, and some of the solutions that we can use. 
the interest for the topic itself came from the lower slide, um, mentioning that 29% of jobs are within San Diego County are accessible by public transit. So it essentially shows that there's this huge um, inefficiency with public transportation and serving the communities that it's actually intended to assist. Um, so basically increasing awareness and shortening the commute times and creating public transit specific channels like doing race platforms or subways would help, uh, help public transportation be more effective and, and time efficient. Um, another, another issue that we see within San Diego is uh, affordable housing in opportune areas. So that way people that are using some of the downtown resources don't have to actually commute. A hurdle that we usually see with affordable housing is that there's no incentives for developers. So offering cash incentives for developers is a way that we can address the hurdle and hopefully see um, interest rise. Hello, I'm Cody. Uh, this is my studio project that addresses the problem of affordable housing in the downtown area. Uh, the concept is to provide subsidized housing for the educators through a tower project. It's also an integrated school. The base of the project is a school. The tower is the educators' subsidized housing that the district could bring in quality teachers and recruit them to California to overcome the, the expensive housing costs here. Um, I also did some screens to uh, reduce solar gain and increase ventilation throughout the project. <clears throat> My research paper uh, ended up focusing on energy efficient desalination processes and different ways to power that. Uh, the biggest takeaways I, I found was the oscillating water column that's typically used to drive a, a turbine to create energy and then that energy is then used to drive a mechanical pump to pressurize reverse osmosis, which is kind of silly double conversion of energy and the loss there. Uh, my proposal was just to use the oscillating water column's hydraulic pressure itself to push the water through the reverse osmosis membrane and then use a separate set of columns to pump the water back to shore for a storage facility. Uh, and it was intended to be an offshore uh, site so that <clears throat> we don't take up valuable coastal real estate is a big problem here. And uh, it also helps distribute the brine as a, a byproduct so it doesn't get into our lagoons and brackish water areas. And another benefit is that San Diego area has a high number of Navy veterans that are subject matter experts on desalination. Every ship has a desalination plant. Uh, so the workforce is already here. Easily integrate that. This is looking at our cul-de-sac interventions on a design charrette. So some of the ideas was to integrate uh, a community garden as the fire break instead of just having a, a pair of a dirt plot between the housing and, and vegetation or sometimes they put succulent rice plants, but actually using it for food production uh, in that environment. <clears throat> uh, would reduce our urban food deserts, bring local produce to your local community, increase carbon capturing, and then you could also bring some businesses in to that park-like area of the terrace. One idea was a zip line. We had some park ideas. We had some cafe ideas in the area. And with the greenhouses, we were also talking about dispensaries and things like that. So you bring businesses into your community. And then another idea was this storm trap. It's a major stormwater collection underground facility. So the entire roadway becomes a storm trap, and you could also use gray water for that as well to provide water for your terrace garden fire breaks. Hello everyone, my name is Yunus. Uh, this is my uh, project for the studio. It's a robotic vocational school. Uh, I've used uh, Bernoulli principle effect here just to suck in fresh air into the building. Uh, I also use like a light by using like a light sky, skylight. And uh, also I have screens on the outer uh, facade of my project so I can spread awareness to, to pedestrians that they can do this or they can do that. So spreading awareness is a, 
I think, a good thing. In my opinion. So this is this was my research paper. So it was about the San Diego irrigation system. Uh, recently, the, the irrigation system uses up to 80 percent water. Uh, water. Uh, so because we're using uh, like a, a good methods to irrigate them, but once we use the artificial intelligence and we can give water directly to the roots of the plant, that would uh, like make this number less by 20%. And also we can uh, monitor the corpse and like what's consume more water. It depends also on the different season of the year. Uh, I was, was going to talk about the affordable house. So I think that we have a previous serious affordable house, and this is like the definition of affordable house. It's supposed not to spend, like the family should not spend more than 30% of their income on a house. I think that two of my solutions, of our solution is accessory dwelling units and land grants from the city. Also trying to address the same problem and the same issue just like by, uh, by <coughs> break it and try to look closer to the, to the issue. Uh, also like reclassifying certain zones, lots, and a rent control, which means like the government have to, to encounter this problem directly. And the rezoning properties for the living itself, uh, and new products. And, uh, so for my studio project, I focus on a couple passive abilities. And for the classroom, uh, it starts with a light shelf that actually is situated 10 feet uh, through a 15 foot wall. So its intentions are to capture indirect sunlight and project it onto the ceiling and then through into the dark spaces of the classroom to kind of reduce the, the need for artificial light. As well as these garage doors that when you open up, it also opens a a bottom hinge window producing a passive ventilation system and then each floor is separated uh, using a one foot gap to bring fresh air and fresh ventilation into the core. So for my research I focused on gray water and kind of how to implement it into San Diego and so the introduction of gray water systems to the hospitality industry could be one way to kind of greatly reduce the use of potable water for kind of, as Shane was saying, irrigation, uh, flushing toilets, and just things that we could use gray water for. So 57, 57 gallons a day are used for outside landscaping. And uh, according to a study I found, a family of four produces around 60,000 gallons of gray water a year, which comes out to 15,000 gallons per person. So if you extrapolate this to a housing industry that says, let's say has 100 people, then that's 1.5 million gallons of gray water annually that you can, that you can use for uh, toilet flushing or irrigation. So another big infrastructure need that we need in San Diego uh, is the San Diego storm drains are almost out of date. And they have uh, over 75,000 storm drain structures and 889 miles of drainage. And a current maintenance protocol is not capable of tracking all of the problems throughout all the, the mileage. And so the consequences of these pipe failures cause backups, uh, which, would, which would then be serious flooding and costly property damage, as well as the pollution uh, into our oceans. So then this degraded infrastructure, why is it important? Well, it transports in the treatment and wastewater treatment uh, is use the heat water account for nearly 20% of the total electricity consumed in California and 30% of non-power plant related natural gas consumptions. During the water transport from San Diego to consumer locations, some 39 gallons of water per service connection a day is, is expelled through leaks. And so these problems, if we have the ability to upgrade the infrastructure, we can just we can seriously mitigate the amount we waste. And then the materials and labor costs were another another thing we looked at. And just with the rapid growth of San Diego's population and the amount we spend and build for housing, 
materials costs have gone up and the lack of natural resources and its expansion has increased these material prices. So for architects, our wages have gone up, engineers and land surveyors, and then as well as every single, every single series of the construction process has, has risen due to the lack of natural, natural resources and material prices. Matt, is that Okay, so team three. Yeah. Team three, and I'm Preston, Francesca, Sam, and Vila. And this is our final presentation for the ES1. Uh, so, my part was uh, waste management. I did my research paper on waste management. And also, my um, studio project was influenced by waste reduction. Uh, so, almost 910,000 tons of trash are delivered to Miramar's landfill yearly uh, and the landfill actually works by it's, it's an excavated land and it has layers of sand, clay, plastic and piping. Uh, the piping is what takes the uh, methane gases to uh, storage tanks which are used to, uh, they are stored or disposed of later. Uh, so why are landfills bad? Um, so the organic matter that is carried to landfills um, it has methane gas in it, and this methane gas is 30, 34 times more powerful than CO2 over a 100-year cycle. Um, the methane, uh, methane gas is actually part of a non-natural -nat cycle, unlike the carbon, which is a problem. If not controlled, it can be very explosive. Um, so what we can do um, to offset this methane gas is to use it in uh, com compost. And the advantages of compost is uh, water pollution prevention and soil enrichment. So as the compost uh, is put down, plants absorb more nitrogen, um, and this nitrogen is then reduced to the groundwater. Uh, uh, so for, for one of the charrettes, we looked at the East Village area, um, and this area is surrounded by residential complexes that I think uh, if if made, uh, if they have areas their are com compost is uh, added, um, it can reduce the organic matter carried to landfills. Uh, and then for my project, um, uh, it's actually an agricultural school, and we use compost uh, to provide crops, crops for the surrounding uh, residential areas. It's also located in East Village, so it will take from um, the residential complexes they are compost and provide crops that way. Again, my name is Sam, so I'll start with my studio project, um, and this aims to be a socially resilient school, so it's a vocational school offering landscape design, carpentry, welding, graphic design, and robotics, but some of the ways that sustainability and architecture were tied in were the use of large overhangs to cool down the building, and then there are mirrored openings on either side of the maker spaces, um, which can be used for cross ventilation. And then there's also a walkway um, in the back that kind of gives um, a healthier, more pedestrian uh, datum for um, people to pass through that's not directly on the street. Um, and then for the uh, natural building materials in San Diego, so for the San Diego Climate Action Plan, um, they're asking for um, designers and builders to find resources within a 100 mile radius of San Diego. So currently, um, you know, materials that are natural and local that are already being used is straw bale and clay and lime plasters. So there's a map of all of the straw buildings in San Diego County. However, there is a lot of research going on and in the future, since we are so close to the ocean, algae may be a really good model to use for natural local building material in addition to mycelium, which can be harvested and grown into these mycelium bricks, uh, in addition to nanotechnology and self-healing concrete. Um, also, for the healthy urbanism in East Village Charette, some of the solutions that uh, our group came up with to make you know, the city more walkable, safe, um, and sustainable were to kind of subdivide the grids so that they would have parklets and urban farm centers that could support the, the buildings on each block. 
and that way there become axes for pedestrians to walk through that become healthier and safer so that you know it's just it's built around the safety of children and then increasing bike lanes on each side to slow down the traffic as well um, and then one thing that the city is doing to kind of help this is the um, the Pershing bikeway project which they're going to make safer and more robust putting a roundabout in and this will help improve the connection from people who live north of Balboa Park to downtown and will kind of help the, the bikeability in downtown San Diego as well. Um, and so my research paper, uh, the three of us did cover uh, public transportation, but mine specifically took the slant of what this means for the community socially. Um, an underdeveloped public transportation system uh, further marginalizes um, minorities, women, and children, and a lot of people who don't have cars wouldn't have the same opportunities um, as people who do. So the light rail transit is actually the most sustainable model, and since we already have the trolley in San Diego, it would make a lot of sense to make this system a lot more robust to connect more parts of the city, and then that way our, our city would become a lot more socially inclusive, and you could develop the trolley stations to have mixed-use spaces, and a lot of these people that our marginalized could get to places and have more job opportunities. Hi, I'm Francesca Radensky. Um, so to join on that, um, San Diego has a problem with affordable housing. Um, a, the lack of affordable housing leads to income inequality and segregated communities, and in extreme cases it leads to homelessness. And a lot of times, um, uh, affordable housing is far away from jobs, so it's located in Temecula or, or North County, and that leads to sprawl. Um, some of the reasons behind uh, lack of affordable housing in San Diego County are that um, zoning and codes uh, discourage density, so there's a lack of um, available housing in San Diego. Um, the cost of building is higher here. And um, like I said, the lack of available housing drives up demand, and there's a uh, a missing middle where uh, medium income housing is not uh, it's not being built because um, luxury housing makes more of a profit and therefore is like more worthwhile to build and um, low income housing is uh, receives subsidies from the government and so that there's a reason to build that as well um, tiny houses so we looked at tiny houses in uh, a charrette that we did um, uh, there, some problems, tiny houses have a smaller footprint and they can become um, a sustainable alternative to building houses in San Diego and especially if you think about um, the potential of putting them in to establish uh, lots, for example, in uh, East County or in, um, uh, in places that have larger lots and um, they can become a viable solution to affordable housing. Um, but Zoning and federal codes have to be changed in order for that to be possible. Um, for my research paper, I looked at transportation and its impact on the city. So um, the city is shaped by uh, its infrastructure and most, most definitely shaped by the methods of transportation in order to get to different places in the city. So higher density um, areas are more effective with buses, subway, rideshares, stockless bikes, and scooters. And um, when you have that infrastructure, that leads to a more centralized, concentrated or urban core. Um, but in low density areas, it's, it's important to have your own vehicle. Um, but when you build or uh, personally own vehicles, it leads to sprawl. Um, the future of transportation, um, as stated by numerous papers, is a multimodal model. So um, that is the idea of taking multiple sources of transportation for one round trip. So for example, you take the train to get to the grocery store and then you take a ride share to get back home um, with your groceries. For my, um, for my studio project, I'm, we're all working on a school and some of the things that informed um, my, my building was looking at uh, the sun path, um, looking at um, uh, the materiality of the building and creating green spaces uh, on the rooftops. Well, my 
and his pradhan. So sea rise, uh, sea level rise, uh, it is uh, one of the main uh, major uh, problem we are facing uh, today. Um, it, uh, some of the solutions are we already adopt, uh, adopted here in the, um, in many parts of the world, like uh, building sea walls, raising roads. Uh, we are started using eleva elevating houses, and uh, we are, we also have storm uh, storm water pumps, uh, but. Uh, in future expansion, we, we might uh, can, um, the there are some uh, hypothetical things like uh, island settlements, uh, floating cities are there. So uh, we, as a group, uh, we came up with one proposal of uh, Mission Valley area uh, to uh, we developed uh, the existing settlements as a to, to migrate and 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 design a. Island settlements or uh, on the coast in the ocean, and we try to introduce new wetland areas at the existing settlements, and we also uh, incorporated bike pathways and stuff so uh, it can it, uh, that area uh, more can be uh, pedestrian friendly. Then we 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 have problem with the seawater, but we don't uh, we don't have that much water to drink uh, or use so uh, there are some some uh, system that we can uh, solve this problem uh, one the major one is fog harvesting system like particularly in san diego, san diego context we can use a uh, fog harvesting system as a uh, a good solution for our water scarcity uh, it, this system is very very uh, simple you can just collect water with the special net uh, uh, net and it collected with the train and it's so simple and cheap to adopt. Uh, so uh, as a group work, we, uh, we we designed a Claremont uh, neighborhood and we uh, we thought uh, a fence uh, in between uh, so uh, in between two houses a fence can be a fog catcher and also can be a a, 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 a privacy uh, uh, element. But in major, in like urban level, we can uh, we can we can use fog towers, uh, fog harvesting towers. So we can uh, uh, we can uh, actually uh, adopt some kind of uh, what uh, fog harvesting towers on uh, our uh, mostly elevated areas like La, La Jolla, Point Loma, and others. As a part of my research, I I try to. Uh, Gather, I, I gathered actually a strategies to accelerate the adoption of public transportation. So uh, actually, San Di I, I came to know that San Diego used to be a public transit uh, city like uh, many years ago. But after automobiles came into existence, and, uh, existence and uh, because of the because of the the attraction towards automobiles, it converted into a vehicle oriented city. Uh, but uh, but so, somehow we can uh, so, uh, first we can do the uh, we can make pedestrian friendly city by narrowing down the uh, very, uh, the four wheeler oriented roads. We have like wide roads, so we can narrow down that uh, roads. Then uh, as a part of uh, public building, uh, visually we have parking lots uh, fronting uh, front of uh, the road, so so people cannot connected with the tunnel systems like easily so we can just up, uh, make it, make that opposite and uh, place the building uh, uh, nearby the road so they uh, people can access the tunnel system easily then we can uh, um, we can actually modify the existing mts system their networks that tunnel systems according to their employment uh, and we can uh, uh, put we can design tunnel system uh, in between uh, employment areas. As a part of my design, I have uh, we are designing school, and I'm, I have tried to um, response immediate context context uh, as a I'm I'm doing extension of the uh, old school. So I have tried to uh, incorporate a public space in my design so I can uh, respond to East Village uh, 
East, East Village uh, proposal, and and I have tried to make one uh, a buffer space in between the building, so a whole urban block can be a uh, better and self-sufficient as an uh, entity. And I tried to uh, do I have tried to solve the radical access, so uh, the drop off and pick up uh, of the uh, kids can be made uh, made easier easier. Um, one of the one of the first weeks we looked at um, sustainable development goals, and these these range from uh, no, no poverty, uh, zero hunger, to uh, reduce inequalities and sustainable cities uh, and design. I didn't realize this was on. Oh, is that on automatic? Yeah. Um, Did it turn automatically by itself? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's go. Let's go in and stop. Let's because that's going to mess you up. Right. Transitions. Turn off transitions. Duration zero. Right. You want to no transition? Uh, no, it's it should just be on mouse click. Yeah. So where where do you click that? It's on the mouse Okay. Let's do this. We got it on the mouse clicker. You can continue where you were at. Let's okay. see. Yeah. Um, oh, wait. So, let's see. So, uh, some of the issues um, that we looked at related to, our, to San, San Diego. Um, are air pollution, clean water, ocean pollution, energy conservation, and water conservation. Um, and then continuing with that, we also looked, we also found issues with parking availability, uh, housing costs and supply, uh, and shortage of affordable housing. Uh, the next week we looked at barriers to affordable and sustainable communities in regard to San Diego. Um, and here's a list of the bullet points that, that we thought uh, were appropriate. Uh, but we, I thought we, we actually focused a little bit more on NIMBYism, one, one of them, or NIMBY, which is an acronym for Not My Backyard, and is a char characterization of op um, opposition by residents to a proposed development in their local area. Then next we looked at zoning, uh, which is the act or process of partitioning a city or town or borough into zones reserved for different proposes or purposes, uh, such as residents and businesses. Um, the next is CEQA, also known, uh, which, which is, it stands for California Environmental Quality Act and it is a statute that requires state and local agencies to identify the significant environmental impacts of their actions and to avoid or mitigate these impacts if feasible. Um, so, um, yeah. uh, so continuing with uh, class, we did water waste and food impacts on buildings. The location we, we were given was in Claremont, um, and then these are the, the rules that we had to do for the charrette, which we all are familiar with. So what we thought was a good strategy for collecting water was doing like basins uh, around the around the canyon, where water could be uh, where water could be held uh, through those like basins. We would distribute it uh, so. I'll just think, I'll just say what I'm So we thought for this project to create, um, to protect the, build the city from fire, the community, uh, we were designing a fort-like uh, sprinkler system, uh, which would be fed through these like basins that would be around the like community. 
Um, and then these like were the basis of the idea. Also, we were thinking of doing a like self-efficient home, which would be able to reuse water, uh, the gray water, rainwater, all types of water. It would just be like a home that is constantly like using the same amount of water in its like process. So that would have been underground. And then we did those basins to store more water when it rained, and then. For the thinking of landscape and food, we thought uh, creating like a boardwalk around the, the, help, the homes would be a great idea to do food gardens where people can gather and communicate and just, um, yeah, just be able to, to grow crops and make this, make like a self-living community like a city where you can like do everything. So here you see the, 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 in the first image, you see the three basins connected to the homes. In the second image, you see the boardwalk connected to the street. Then here in the first image, you see the sprinkler systems. Um, and those are connected through, through like a fort. And then second image shows the, the homes with the, the self-efficiency. Self and the concluding image shows everything together. Then we moved on into building materials. We were to focus in San Diego uh, with a 100 mile radius. Um, that's the radius in the map that we were to focus in to find materials. And the ones we found were sand, straw, Salt, I guess lat, but salt, <laughs> plastic trash, uh, or trash, uh, which there's a ton of trash right now happening in these cities. I don't know how it got to this level of trash, but there's a lot of plastic and trash. Um, using types of boulders and rocks, not specifically those small rocks, but talking about like big boulders. Uh, rammed earth was a really interesting material, uh, and then earth bags. Earth bags could also be, what was, oh yeah, earth bags. Uh, we decided to focus on salt, um, which is salt, seawater, um, and then the seawater becomes fresh water because of the desalination uh, produce. They can, you can produce salt to eat and then salt to make bricks. Um, you can make, make communities out of it and then it involves architecture. Um, like it was said earlier, uh, salt works in compression, uh, not in tension. Um, and then the premises is to pump, oh, so the, the way that it works is just they pump seawater into, they use the energy, I guess the sun to evaporate water and then they use the salt, I don't, yeah. There's a lot of like cool projects that are using salt right now, um, which is like a hotel, there's a salt hotel. There are using salt blocks to actually start building stuff. So salt is actually being currently used, which is pretty interesting. And then we jumped into the next topic. Um, hello, my name is Vera. So the next topic is San Diego Health Environment. And I would like to start from pointing out the main issues uh, existing now and that you can see. Here on the map, you can see uh, the area uh, highlighted is it is uh, the downtown of San Diego, and uh, there is a lack of public spaces and park. Uh, also, we can see that streets are dedicated to vehicles. Uh, there are only two main boards without any greenery, and we can't really notice that they are main. Uh, they are not friendly. They are not human scale. Uh, there, are, there is numerous exposed parking lots create, uh, which create unpleasant surrounding. Uh, no walkable connections between different parts of the city. And uh, the existing Central Park is just crossed by different uh, highways and also parking lots. Uh, and there's no consistency and coherent uh, environment in this. So uh, these are the main issues that should be fixed for now. And uh, we can see there is just uh, no, generally no uh, healthy environment existing in the city. And uh, I oppose the reference Barcelona, which has also uh, historical 
uh, downtown, uh, which is much older than in San Diego, but however, uh, the new city uh, is created uh, based on the rectangular uh, grid as well, and we see that uh, there are like green nodes, green squares, uh, and all of them are connected by green boards uh, on walkable distances, and uh, uh, there is a really human scale and friendly environment created in the city. Um, so possible solutions here could be uh, creating more public spaces, creating human-friendly urban design on the streets, uh, highlighting existing boulevards, uh, also removing that exposed parking lots that uh, exist now, uh, redesigning the existing, the existing central park, and paying, atten paying attention to transit highways across the city. Uh, it is very convenient uh, for having a vehicle and cross uh, through the city uh, using these highways, however, they really create unfriendly environment around them, uh, especially for residents and for pedestrians. <laughs> so here on the map you can see uh, already improved solution how uh, uh, the situation in the city can be improved. So there are two main boulevards, additional boulevards uh, will be created and also a uh, big park uh, right opposite our new school of architecture and design that we already all know. Uh, the next topic was Mission Bay in San Diego and adaptation needs. Um, uh, so this is the zone mostly, in fact, can be mostly affected by um, storms and floodings. And there are existing issues here, so pollution of the bay, uh, city planning issues, there is a difficult navigation in the area, and also sand erosion, flooding risks, sea level rises together with storms coming around. And uh, if it comes, if it really uh, happens, then all this area must be flooded. Uh, there are also salt intrusions uh, into plant area, and ecosystem gets damaged. Destroyed beaches uh, can can be here as well. And these are possible solutions, so uh, we would like to probably first we start from zoning of the city and create a new city code, first for residential zones of this uh, specific area, which can be flooded, uh, setting up uh, offsets uh, and creating more recreational spaces and probably dedicating all these uh, small islands to uh, greenery first, to parks and to, um, to environment. And also, there is a dead, dead end on the south uh, area of, uh, of Mission Bay, and we would like to propose probably uh, create a rise to a highway that could be way out of the area in, terms, in, in case of flooding. And what can be in the future? So, probably flooding islands. This is a famous project, this, but I'm, I'm sure everybody knows. we focused on tiny house support village in uh, San Diego. We have provided low income permanent supportive housing uh, facilities for community engagement and safety. Uh, we provide wellness inspired living environment with uh, 18 individual tiny houses gathering in three cluster of six. Uh, we provide easy to maintain the efficient infrastructure. <laughs> Infrastructure. <laughs> and leverage uh, reuse and green principles that are embraced by a uh, city of Vista in California. Um, the main we had two main focuses: to design. We design the buildings and infrastructures, and uh, designing the landscape. And uh, uh, by designing the design, uh, we put units and. Videos next to the buildings. Uh, we designed walking paths, uh, parking areas, and uh, we tried. We used um, solar panels to uh, solve energy efficiency. Um, then for the landscape, we put gardens and we uh, support gathering spaces and landscape. Um, for 
are the focusing to houses. Uh, the main bullet points were affordability, um, covers the needs that people who are going to use these um, houses, less weight, sustainable, uh, and um, kind of serves for a simple uh, life circle, and uh, it, can, it can be flexible, and we can kind of rebuild some part of the um, areas that we have in the uh, house. And um, uh, when, while we went to our uh, site, we kind of see um, and analyze the area. And we, yeah, the area is at approximately uh, 28,000 square feet. And, um, it's half block east of 8, uh, 13th Street between E Street and F Street in San Diego. And it's close to the, uh, it's in the East West, so it's kind of surrounded with uh, mixed use um, structures and buildings. Um, the, the side concert, uh, consideration, um, the, there was limited neighborhood inter integration, lack of green and public spaces, uh, both building heights and building typology around the site was kind of high. Um, and uh, for the solving these problems, uh, there are two already proposed um, things that, which is uh, 14th Street Promenade and uh, East Village Green. So for the um, diagrams, we so um, there was a noise in the F street, F street because of the um, highway, and the wind was coming from north to east, south, um, and there was lots of traffic, and uh, we saw the sound pad, and we analyzed the height of the streets, and um, we kind of show, see user profile because we had another high school um, school around us and um, kind of experiment the shadows um, which affect our site. So for my uh, student project, um, the main uh, idea is flexibility, which brings sustainability with it. So if we don't want to use any space in this built, uh, old kind of campus, we can just take it off and then it can be more energy efficient, and I use solar panels in my rooftop, and so. And for my research paper, um, the topic was zero waste, which is focused on solid waste. Um, I mainly uh, explained um, the issues about solid waste, with how it affects the environment, but the main idea of, uh, of my research paper was like how we can solve the problem. And then the, um, kind of I put the bullet points of how we can solve the problems, like changing the rules, um, shifting subsidies, um, design for environment, clean production, uh, distribution, empowered consumers, uh, resource recovery centers, uh, produ producer responsibility, and jobs for environment. So my research paper, um, the title was Exponential Population Growth and Its Environmental Impact, a San Diego case. Um, so I actually found out that San Diego is not only the fastest growing city uh, in California, but the fastest growing city in the nation. Uh, so I think it's very relevant uh, to this city. So I have two uh, paragraphs that I felt um, really capture the essence of my essay, and I'll just, I'll just read the first one. Um, so, if current predictions of population growth prove accurate and patterns of human activity remain unchanged, science and technology may not be able to prevent either irreversible degradation of the environment or continued poverty for much of the world. Um, actually, I'll, the, the next one I'll, I'll just briefly um, 
So a sustainable society would be uh, interested in qualitative development, not physical expansion. It would use material growth as a considered tool, not a perpetual mandate. It would be neither for nor against growth. Before the society would decide on any specific growth proposal, it would ask what the growth was for and who would benefit and what it would cost and how it would last and whether it would be accommodated by the sources and sinks of our planet. Um, so this is, um, so since I'm in the three quarter three thesis, uh, this quarter has been dedicated mostly to research. Um, so this is a very conceptual, um, very conceptual image of uh, our charrette that we did. So it's, the title is Meditation Architecture and Encounter with Existence. And my, um, my thesis statement is through the process of incorporating properly calculated spaces of stillness and refuge from modern, modern society, we can aid our collective mental health by reducing stress and with it its destructive ramifications. Uh, so, uh, so uh, the site that I chose was, is in the Four Corners region of the United States called the Painted Desert, and it's very isolated, so it wouldn't really it wouldn't have the ability to connect to uh, a power grid. So I wanted to create a, a net zero or net plus building. Uh, so I'll, I'll be sure uh, this year to include an area it has wind turbines and uh, photovoltaics. Uh, also, I just recently uh, selected the specific site and I chose an area by a mesa uh, on the eastern side so it would give some protection from the, uh, the excessive western uh, sun. For my research paper, uh, my title is Wastewater Management System in Tijuana and San Diego. Um, there is a lot of good information and a lot of bad things happening with trash. So as rain is happening right now, I only fear all the trash that is actually going into the ocean right now. Um, so the population growth in Tijuana is growing 3% uh, a year, which is a lot of people. It's the Baja California Sur is Norte. Baja California is the eighth largest state in Mexico. So it's 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 driving, it's attracting a lot of people and the wastewater plants don't have the power or they're over thirty years old and a wastewater plant needs to be switched every thirty every thirty years actually and they're like around or I think thirty years is like a lot of time for it's it's making the the structure deteriorate, as how like other people were saying earlier, um, and the idea of the research paper was investigating like why is nothing happening with the the problem. Um, there there are two like super large uh, watersheds in this area, which is the San, in San Diego, which is one, and in there's one in Point Loma, but it's not as big as the the one in Black, in Black, in Black, in between, um, it's down there. Um, but these are like super large and are like in soup in a lot of problems right now. Uh, and the problem is that people don't, the government doesn't want to fund all these things. Um, and in Mexico, I interviewed uh, someone that works for CESP, which is the, one of the companies that is filtrating all the water. And they were saying, and he was explaining that the Mexican government's ignorance is just because of the, what they believe is since the structure is not seen, like it's not visual to the eye, they don't, they don't want to invest in it. So, so Mexico is very of like they won't, you want to see what is like happening. So, or like be recognized as like they did this project. Like they wouldn't want to like uh, do that. Um, and then my my. Studio project. Uh, my studio project is called the New High School. Um, I'm using solar panels uh, in the roof to make the whole building work. Uh, and the initial idea was to to make 
these huge chambers that hold water, freeze them, boil them, and like heat and cool the the, the, the building. Um, so that's the, the idea that I keep carrying. Water is going to become the new gold very soon. Uh, we're running out of it for cutting rivers. Um, it's a topic that is not talked about um, because it's so accessible and so cheap. But if it was expensive, like you would be like, oh my god, water. But it's so accessible that you forget that it's coming I mean, not available. Um, And one more research was made on, on the issue of uh, energy efficiency as a source of affordable housing. And the aim of my research was to showcase uh, all the benefits, uh, all the issues and all the solutions possible. Um, that energy efficiency really makes uh, housing affordable um, in spite uh, of negative uh, public perception which exists due to uh, not accessible uh, public research uh, and uh, what is needed here is first the new policies uh, which would promote green building construction and also resources accessible for public sh uh, that would showcase the benefits of energy efficiency using the housing and uh, as all the benefits uh, which go uh, of, with, together with green construction um, mostly it goes in one long term uh, relation and it's a reduced cost of all utilities. Um, environmental conservation, positive pu public perception in the end. Um, and my school project proposal uh, is dedicated to middle and high school. Uh, I tried to respond to the site as most as, I, as possible and the shape was created uh, in terms to, uh, to deliver daylight to existing buildings uh, uh, of uh, the urban academy, uh, and uh, all the cut made, cuts made in the building body was uh, also in terms of delivering that uh, precious daylight. Uh, every room has a daylight as well. Classrooms uh, themselves are flexible spaces. Uh, they can open up to each other and create a uh, general common spaces uh, for some common classes. Uh, and also there was a measure of uh, natural ventilation inside the building and uh, outside the building, uh, which also has openings in, in its body, uh, which also doesn't look again. Thank you.